Coming up on Network Africa. Tanzanian opposition leader Freeman Mbowe arrested. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa among targets of potential phone spying. Plus. U.S. military launches first airstrike in Somalia under Biden administration. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo Lashibo Ali. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa is among world leaders uh, believed to have targeted uh, for spy, uh, phone tapping using spyware. Known as Pegasus, it infects phones and allows operators to spy on their targets. Its leaked database is said to include the mobile phone numbers of at least a dozen head of states and governments. They are in a list of some 50,000 phone numbers of people believed to be of interest to clients of Israeli-based NSO group, the makers of Pegasus. Other leaders in the database include French President Emmanuel Macron, President Bahram Sali of Iraq, and the current prime ministers of Pakistan, Egypt and Morocco, and the King of Morocco. The list was leaked to major news outlets. The NSO group denies any wrongdoing and says it sold the equipment only to vetted governments to combat crime and terrorism. The South African government says authorities will destroy all recovered looted goods once they have been used as evidence in criminal cases. The acting minister in the presidency says the police are conducting home searches in a bid to recover stolen items. People have also been asked to voluntarily surrender them Crowds looted at least 200 shopping centers during unrest that erupted following jailing of former president Jacob Zuma for 15 months earlier this month for contempt of court. More than 200 people died in the violence that mainly affected the provinces of Hauteng and KwaZulu-Natal. Well, still in South Africa, Hauteng Provincial Government and the road freight industry have established a freight forum to improve efficiencies in the sector. More than 40 trucks distributing food and goods across the country were the first casualties in the violent arson and looting attacks that gripped the country last week. The sector is counting the cost after the attacks, but are demanding a string of measures from government to ensure the industry is protected from attacks whenever things go wrong. Our South Africa Bureau Chief, Betty Debias, spoke to the Chief Executive of the Road Freight Association, Gavin Kelly. What would you like to see done in terms of priority as well to secure the, 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 the pivotal role that your, your, your association plays? Well, I think, you, you know, the, the routes that move goods through the country need to be secured. And whether that means using a, a system of police to, to secure those or the on traffic police. Basis, yeah. On a permanent basis. Yes, yes, on a permanent basis. And one of the roles of traffic police is to ensure the safe and free flow of traffic. So they need to do that. And the second thing is that a very stern message need, or clear message needs to go out from government that you can't just go and attack you know, institutions or industries that have got nothing to do with your issue. There, we've, we've got such different levels of legislation in this country where people can raise their voice. And if it's a service delivery issue, take it through the relevant parties. You don't have to attack people and burn people. The matter around foreign drivers, which I'm sure you're aware of, there are structures to deal with that. You don't have to burn trucks and kill people. I mean, thank goodness. Thank goodness we haven't had anybody killed in, in this sort of protest violence. And I mean in terms of burning trucks or, or 
that sort of idea. People have been killed, but that's in a different, that's around looting and it's around more crowd control, et cetera, et cetera, it would seem. So that needs to be made very clear that if you're going to break the rule of the law, the law will deal with you. We've had an, enough of the police standing and watching it happening, and, and that's historical as well. And then I think finally, government needs to take seriously when private sector gives them information around what's happening and they need to deal with it. And, and if they then ascertain the threat as not being realistic, they need to communicate that to private sector. But they need to act on the information that they get. And quite often we've got ears on the ground, we've got drivers, we've got business out, out there who work with the communities and need to deal with it. And then, and then I think finally, the programs that they say they've been putting in place, obviously some of them haven't been working. They need to look at why they're not working and if they need partnerships with private sector, they need to do that. Finally, now, just quickly, what conversations is your association or the industry having with insurance right now? With insurance? We haven't had uh, much conversation with them except around the whole SUSRIO, which is the South African insurance body that really covers the riots and unrest and that sort of specifically created for that many, many decades ago. But we haven't yet had our members asking us to talk to insurance, I suppose, because no one submitted the insurance claims yet. Yeah. I think everyone is still in the process of, of assessing yeah. yes, what sort of damage they have and what have you. I mean, we have some insurance brokers and some insurance companies who are members of ours and everyone has said generically that you know claims will be paid but of course each and every one has a specific contract and they could be provisors in those contracts and that's not an area we're going to get in, involved in more importantly we have spoken to susria and they have made a blanket uh, statement a couple of days ago saying that they have got finances to cover whatever claims are going to come in. Well, then, good luck to them. Let's hope that that is going to be the situation. Some updates from the COVID-19 pandemic now. South Africa's opposition party, the Economic Freedom Fighters, have led groups of restaurant owners and employees and affiliated businesses in a protest at the Department of Tourism, Pretoria, demanding the end of lockdown and for normal operation of restaurant hours. The political party group says the effect of adjusted lockdown level four is seriously dealing with the restaurant businesses and they want the Department of Tourism to do something to help improve the state of the sector. South Africa is currently under level four lockdown restrictions, which include a 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. curfew. This adversely affects the entertainment industry, which mostly thrives at night. <laughs> Away from South Africa, Tunisia's health minister, Fauzi Mehdi, has been sacked as the country struggles to cope with surging numbers of coronavirus cases. He faced criticism for organising the opening of vaccination stations to all Tunisians aged 18 over the Muslim holiday of Eid al hadha According to reports, tens of thousands flocked to them on Tuesday, but the jabs quickly ran out, leading to stampedes and some violence. Coronavirus has put the medical system in the North African nation under severe pressure, and there have been oxygen shortages at hospitals in several provinces. Earlier this month, a health ministry spokesman described the situation as catastrophic. 
Now, a report by a U.S.-based rights group, Human Rights Watch, says a Kenyan government support program benefited just a small fraction of those in need and was beset by irregularities. President Uhuru Kenyatta last year announced a weekly stipend for needy households, which he said had been identified as most vulnerable to the economic impact of COVID-19. It was discontinued later in the year. Rosemary Mungai supports her seven grandchildren by selling soap in Nairobi's Kibera slum. And she's one of the thousands that U.S.-based rights group Human Rights Watch say have been failed by a government support scheme intended to shield the Kenyan capital's poorest from the impact of the global health crises. When coronavirus came, we experienced so many problems because there was just no money. President Uhuru Kenyatta announced the 10 billion shilling or $92.5 million cash transfer program in May 2020. But on Tuesday, July 20th, HRW said the scheme, which ended in December, was crippled by irregularities, including cronyism. Officials ignored eligibility benchmarks, the report said, and quotes, directed benefits to their relatives or friends. HRW also said only a small fraction of those in need benefited. Nairobi's eight informal settlements, less than 5% were enrolled in the cash transfer program by October. Kenyan officials have dismissed the report's finding as propaganda. The report did not accuse Safaricom, Kenya's biggest mobile operator, of any wrongdoing. Rosemary is one example. According to HRW, she received a thousand shillings, or a little over nine dollars, for just a few weeks. She's had to share food and supplies with neighbors who received no support, and though schools have reopened, she can no longer afford to send her grandchildren to school. To security matters now, the United States has carried out an airstrike against Islamist al-Shabaab militants in Galkayo in northern Somalia. Tuesday's airstrike was the first since President Joe Biden took office. Defense Department spokeswoman Cindy King says the U.S. had been supporting the Somali army that was under attack by the militants. She adds that an assessment of the damage is still being done, but initial reports were that no civilians were injured. President Biden has limited the use of drone strikes. His predecessor, Donald Trump, had increased airstrikes in Somalia during his tenure. Just before he left office, he ordered that 700 special forces deployed to Somalia be withdrawn. Al-Shabaab controls much of southern and central Somalia and regularly launches attacks against the UN-backed government. Still to come on the program. Egypt's Alexandria inaugurates first public beach for people with disabilities. More in a moment. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Let's head over to East Africa now, where Tanzanian opposition leader Freeman Umbowe has been arrested for inciting unauthorized assembly. His Chadema party says he was in his hotel room on Tuesday night in Mwanza in the northwestern region, where he was attending party meetings when he was detained. Officials from Tanzania's main opposition party say they have not been able to establish where Mr. Mbowe is being held. The party adds 10 other leaders arrested uh, alongside him had been taken to the central police station in Mwanza. The police confirmed the arrest on suspicion of inciting unauthorized assembly. The opposition party has been holding a series of internal meetings in an effort to revive support and had vowed to hold a big political rally to push for the drafting of a new constitution. <laughs> Now, over in the Democratic Republic of Congo, an activist and national youth coordinator in the Democratic Republic of Congo has been jailed for incitement to civil disobedience. Jackie Ndala from the Together for the Republic Party of ex-Katanga Governor Moise Katumbi was arrested on Sunday and sentenced to two years in prison on Tuesday. He was also fined $250. The prosecutors presented a video showing him calling on party members and supporters 
supporters to stump parliament and stop debate on the controversial Congolit bill. This proposed legislation was submitted for debate in July by Insinga Pululu, an MP from President Philip Shizakedi's party. It would exclude anyone whose parents were both not Congolese from contesting in a presidential election. And back here in Nigeria, the rail transport system may have been up and running in some corridors in Nigeria since the 1900s, but there's been a long break along the line with the cane infrastructure and the revitalization of the rail lines all playing out in recent years. Nigerian Railway does have some historical interest, but how much of this transformation is documented? In this special report, our correspondent, Dari Dawu, highlights how the history of the Nigerian Railway is defining the current state of things and efforts at preserving that part of Nigerian Railway history. At the railway compound in Ebutimeta, where all was said to have started in 1898, one still gets to see the solid foundation laid over a century ago on which some of the current structures are built. As new structures are fading out the old, some materials are abandoned unceremoniously, some kept as artifacts. The Nigerian Railway Corporation is one of the oldest institutions in the country. Of course, this place in the Butimeta, the railway compound, holds a special place in history, from personalities, buildings, to artifacts, from pre-colonial to post-colonial events. A walk down in this compound is a walk down memory lane. We are here today not only to trace the past, but to connect current situations and current events. One of the old locomotives can still be found at the running shed, old, rusty, and immobile. We stopped by the Jekyll House, a mini museum at the railway compound. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Jekyll House. Thank you very Join me to take you to, through our history. The driver of the train would take a key from here, point A, Ebutemeta, and take that key and report that key that he has arrived as a way to log his presence as he badon. And then at will, the person managing or monitoring can call and communicate. This is an air alarm. And in this air alarm, it is used to signal an oncoming train for people who are walking on the tracks. So what happens is that, well, this is before the advent of the trains now had their own horns and sound, is that once a train is coming, you would have somebody, an onlooker, do this. And when he does this, he is telling people that a train is coming, a train is coming. The railway heritage is not only preserved inside the building, there are some still sitting on rail tracks. Okay, yeah, let's see. Okay, okay. back. Yeah, back. Mm. Up. <laughs> wow. Yeah. This one that I'm sitting on is called the pump trolley. So in those days, uh, this pump trolley is used in checking the tracks. So the technical officers sit down here, and we have four men that will be doing the pumping to make uh, the pump trolley to move. Away from Ebutemeta, we caught up with 90-year-old engineer Nath Okoro, nicknamed Authentic Railway Man, a name he earned for his vast knowledge of the Nigerian railway system, having worked as the first managing director of the corporation. NRC headquarters became headquarters because the British were here. From 1898, they started construction of the railways from Lagos. So everything was settled here. The white people moved to Okaira. That's the present railway headquarters, um, where we live in Ebutemeta. That area is called Okaira. Did you know that? Well, that's the name. Okay? That Okaira was first round from the market area. That was Okaira for the white people. We were about the first group of black men to live there. There's no light, eh? Brother, it's nice, sir. Why haven't you put it on? 
The Texas Street Library Way stacks up a catalog of books about railways and still documenting more on his laptop. So everything you want to know about railway, you remember this year. By trying to preserve history because we seem to have lost a lot of... Well, how many of them have asked us what to... What sense? What do they know? They've lost even the books. They don't have. Some of us have them. The story of the Nigerian Railway is not complete without tracking and documenting key events that shaped the railway ecosystem. These custodians of history believe will further help the nation foster more development in this sector. Dari Idu, Channels Television News. And finally on the program, a disabilities-friendly public beach has opened up in Egypt's second largest city of Alexandria. A third of the beach is equipped with a wooden platform that extends to the water. It's the first of its kind in the region. Take a look. When teenager Abdurrahman Mohammed would go to the beach in his coastal city of Alexandria, he would have to stay by the sidewalk watching other children swim from the confines of his wheelchair. Today, as the governorate inaugurated its first disability-friendly beach, he can push his wheelchair down a platform, receive assistance from aid workers, and use floaters to swim in the water. The initiative is part of a wider campaign to make several beaches in Egypt's Alexandria more open to people with disabilities. We are happy. We now have our own beach for those with disabilities in Alexandra. This is the first beach of its kind in the Republic. We used to look out to the sea from the sidewalk. We couldn't swim or enjoy the water. Now we are like everyone else. In everything, we don't need or ask for help from anyone. We make it to the beach with our own wheelchairs and canes and enjoy the water. Called Al Mondara, the beach is around 230 meters long and a third of it has been allocated for people with disabilities. The beach is equipped with a wooden platform that extends all the way to the water, aid workers that assist visitors, special chairs, and a rescue team with an ambulance on standby. In a few days, we'll get a barrier that we'll place in the sea so that people with disabilities can swim while being surrounded by it and they can be in the water without putting their lives in danger. A 2006 census found that nearly a million Egyptians have some form of disability, though some experts estimate that the number is closer to 8 million or 10% of the population. Of these, nearly half have conditions that require some sort of intervention. The latest initiative is also meant to encourage inclusivity, making public venues more accessible to everyone. And that's the programme today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenny Olash Shibuali. Bye for now.